Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome back to A Lovely Junt where we read better, not more. Today I am back with another discussion video and I want to talk a little bit about my experiences of feeling like I'm growing out of YA, which it's just about time because I'm in my mid-30s, so I want to talk about why I think it's happening now, why I think it hasn't happened before, some of the recent YA books that I've read, even books that I've liked, and why they're just not hitting home and really being successful, super, super successful reads for me. So I'm going to be talking about The Inheritance Games and The Scholomance as examples today. I just recently read both of those, including the last book in the Scholomance trilogy. The Inheritance Game. It was fun. It delivered exactly what it needed to. It was well paced. It had good plot puzzles within it. It had a fun romance subplot and enough glamorous rich people stuff to make the setting of being sort of like in the environment of this extraordinarily wealthy and privileged family really, really fun. What I imagine sort of like the, the crazy rich Asians or high fantasy might do for us um, in other genres, right? I also finished The Golden Enclaves, which is book three in the Scholomant series. Naomi Novik has been for a long time one of my favorite YA authors. I do think she's a little bit of a cut above what some of the other authors are doing. She often has a little bit more sophisticated characterization. She is extremely creative. I think she has fun, unique fantasy worlds that we're in. You know, they're familiar enough to be really palatable and fit squarely into that fantasy genre, but she always brings something unique. And I, I think her main problem tends to be an editing problem. I frequently wish like I was her editor and I could advise her to take the, like, if you broke up her book into sixths, it is the fourth sixth that needs to be edited down. I know that's a weird way to talk about it, but it's not the, it's not the second third, it's the fourth sixth, just that portion that needs to be like edited down and, and streamlined. <laughs> I felt the same way both about Spinning Silver and Uprooted, and I also feel like she's improved a lot as a writer, so even like the difference between Uprooted and Spinning Silver, I think there shows a huge amount of growth as a writer too. So that's kind of like my general thoughts on those two books. One of the things that I'm realizing is a me problem that just comes down to taste. It has nothing to do with how good or bad on a sort of literary or artistic level is romance subplots. It's a me problem and I am not relating to those plots anymore. I never have been really one to go in for a romance plot. I don't enjoy romance books and I've very rarely enjoyed rom-coms or romance films even growing up from like a teenage romance. I, I always had a really hard time relating to them or finding them enjoyable or even or even the kind of thing uh, like I think for a lot of people they are definitely a fantasy world that you want to escape into and I never really wanted to do that. Apart from Jane Austen I've always loved Austen and I also really like Jane Eyre and things like that. There are some some very niche types of romance plots, kind of like this woe is me, sad little overlooked girl romance plot that I can get behind, but that can also be like overdone and pathetic. Anyway, it's like I can't really pinpoint to you exactly why romance is something that I don't enjoy, but only recently have I found like teen romances kind of dull and repetitive, and I'm so you know, getting further and further from the age of the characters that it's becoming harder and harder to relate to their feelings and connect with the characters as they're going through their teenage romances. But again, I'm not the target audience for these books. This is a me problem. This is not a problem with the book. I think the books are executing these romances just fine. It's just that I'm not the target audience and I am drifting further and further away from that target audience. And on top of that, I do think it's a repetition problem because I do think a lot of the romances that unfold in YA books across genres unfold in a repetitive way. Um, and even within their genres, you know, if there's going to be a fantasy story, I know that it's going to be a love triangle and da 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 da, or especially like a chosen one fantasy. Like I know exactly how this is going to play out. And it becomes repetitious, you know, not in a comforting way, but in a dull and boring way for me. The other thing is that I prefer character driven books and 
This isn't universally true for YA, but many YA books, the majority of YA books, 60%, 70%. I do think even in a character-driven novel, I would be happier reading a book where the internal world of a character is more well-developed. And this is where I get into the difference of like why I enjoy Naomi Novak and like why I enjoyed the Scalamette series maybe more than I did the Inheritance game because the inner world is very well developed for our main character L in that series as opposed to our main character in the Inheritance game Avery is like not well developed at all like we are told that she is a smart girl and it appears from her behavior that she actually really is quite mature and I think like in a lot of ways I would have liked getting to know her better but we spend very little time having her sort of like puzzle out you know why she thinks this is happening to her or how reflecting even on how it's changing her and changing her friendship with her old friends or changing her relationship with her sister she and her sister are very clearly drifting apart but there's no reflection on that there's no reflection on you know which of the boys she's attracted to and why and what it inspires in her like she doesn't have an inner world and I think that's does a real disservice to even like the way that we articulate ourselves particularly as teenage girls if we're encountering this sort of thing you know Avery is the kind of character who's like a leaf on the river of the plot she's like carried along by the plot and when you couple that with a lack of internal reflection I think that's you know uh, it does a disservice to the character but it also does a disservice to like other teenage girls who might be reading this book because the agendas of the side characters are very well you know explored or at least questioned or like she's curious about what their agendas are and it's clear that they have agendas and that they have certain goals that they're trying to achieve and some of them are nefarious and not good for her um, and so you know it would be it would behoove these writers both to write a better book and I think to empower young women especially when you have a female main character to flesh out these internal worlds for these characters so that we can understand well what's Avery's agenda what does she want out of this what are her dreams because her dream you know to just not be poor or not struggle through life the way she had to previously isn't good enough I would want something like more articulated and fresh fleshed out even if it's like relatable that she's not precisely sure what she wants to do but she has certain interests and joys and these types of things that just like you don't know about Avery because she's not a very well-rounded character. I also mentioned this like discussing the internal worlds of character a little bit when I was doing my analysis of Ninth House by Leigh Bardugo in my discussion on Dark Academia. She's also a character who very much lacks an inner world, who very much lacks an agenda, um, and I think it, again it would have made that book better as well. On the other hand perhaps you can take up too much space on the page and this was of course my criticism of the Scholomance series and Naomi Novik's writing in general is that she needs to be edited down a little bit. In the case of the Scholomance, and this is giving nothing away because this is something that Galadriel explores in her internal world very early on from the first book, is the way in which enclavers or people who are kind of um, inducted into these sheltered environments that help keep their families and their children safe, basically they do so at the expense of making other people unsafe and how Galadriel is unwilling to compromise in that way she has to she holds this very like upright standard right and so I mean the amount of time that we spend with Galadriel describing to us the politics of this situation and why people would make that decision but why she can't and da 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 da, da. I mean like 10,000 times we go over this internal debate that she has from book one and by the time we get to the golden enclave she you know is still multiple times throughout the book discussing this and there are even times where like you know I really appreciate how well developed her internal world is and she like Avery like Alex they're both they're all first person narrators so it's a very good opportunity for us to live inside of their heads there are times where she's like you know there's a situation where there's a conversation going on and Galadriel like sort of explains the politics behind what's going on or the magic system behind what's going on for the umpteenth time and then that leads into like a memory from her childhood which gives some context for who she is and why she is which I actually really enjoy but there are times where we go so far afield that 
I forget where we are in the story and like, oh yeah, we're actually in the present time talking to this person from the London Enclave doing this situation because we have gone so far afield from the present action. And you can definitely take developing the interior worlds of your character too far. There are a lot of YA books that also, like Galadriel, have female protagonists who are uncompromising. So they're unwilling to make moral compromises and frequently they're unwilling to um, allow their friends to make sacrifices in whatever high stakes situation. For other characters, this feels like needlessly self-sacrificing. So I remember, oh gosh, what was that book with like the Darkling and all of that with the, the antlers? Shoot. I will put it on screen somewhere, you know, and so there's like, <laughs> there's like this thing we're mounting to the, to the conflict with the big bad. She realizes, oh no, people might get hurt or die. She's the chosen one. I can't, you know, she takes it on as like, oh, it's my fault if people die, even though like she's not killing anyone, the big bad is killing someone. And then she like, you know, undercuts the entire plan. She like self-sabotages and sabotages the entire plan so that like she and her friends like don't accomplish what they're doing and that's always like the end of book one anyway i'm going on a rant here <laughs> and uh and that allows like book two to be a placeholder and book three to be a repetition of book one so you can have a trilogy and she's like never willing to like do the difficult thing that like hard times require oh it's like my hugest pet peeve in way for l this becomes much more grounded in her character like this uncompromising perspective that she has on the world. One, because we see the choices that her mother made. We understand the kind of um, way that she interacts with magic and the purity with which she interacts with the good magic, which I, the name of which is now escaping me. And then we also see and know very clearly that for Galadriel, she has this affinity for very dark, destructive magic. And she knows that if she puts one toe over the line, it's like, all downhill from there. She knows she can't even, you know, mess with that. Um, and so it becomes much more grounded for her and in her character why she would make these choices. We have in the past, I think on booktube and on YouTube and in articles and the, the internet book land, if you will, discussed sort of like Bella Swan as this bland narrative main character that allows the reader to put themselves in the shoes of Bella so that they can escape into the fantasy of the romance with Edward and blah, blah, blah. And I think that's one reason to make a character bland is that they have broader appeal because the more specific you make them, the more different they're going to be from any one of your readers, right? A character like Galadriel in The Scholomance is more polarizing. If you don't like her, you won't like being in her head for three books. It would be totally reasonable not to like her because she has a very present personality, warts and all, flaws and all. In a lot of ways, she's, an, she's a grumpy character. She's an unlikable character. Maybe the goal is to have as innocuous a narrative point of view as possible, but I think there are other ways that you can get around this. I'm referencing yet again my video on third person closed versus first person narrative. Like you don't have to ha choose first person narration. If you want to have a more amenable point of view that people are reading from without sacrificing characterization, just use third person close people. First person is actually really, really hard to write in. I don't understand, I do not understand why these YA books are always first person. I always dislike it when books make choices that serve the plot rather than being natural outworkings of what that character would do in that circumstance. I think that's just one of the textbook definitions of bad writing, so don't do it. Um, and there are moments in the um, Inheritance game where I felt that that happened, wh where Avery is like just going along with what is happening simply to serve the plot, to allow certain things to unfold. She doesn't question anything. And so there are times where it's like, that would actually be a dumb choice. And you're trying to convince me that Avery is like this super smart girl. And she's supposed to be kind of street smart. 
No. There are also a couple choices where her bodyguard and her lawyer, who are presumably the best that money can buy, make some stupid choices that are obviously like required by the plot to go against what someone in their situation would do. And I'm thinking specifically here of like the shopping trip. So basically, this is like the most shoehorned situation that this book does, which otherwise like doesn't do too often compared to other books that I've read. But like, <clears throat> So they so there's been a live shooter on the home, at the house, at the mansion, on the grounds of the mansion, which are supposed to be super locked down, right? And so the bodyguard decides that Avery should go on a shopping trip, get her outside of the safety and confines of the home where they have everything locked down and they have all their security systems and all their guards, put her in a vulnerable situation in order to draw out the shooter in case so that they can find him. A bodyguard is not a detective. A bodyguard's number one goal is not to solve the mystery of who is the shooter. Let the police do that. A bodyguard's number one goal is to keep the bazillionaire that you work for alive. You don't put them in vulnerable situations. But why did the plot need this to happen so badly? Well, Avery needed to go on the shopping trip with the, like, cousin's friend or whatever, who's like the best friend of the previous... Anyway, I'm getting into details of the plot that are not important. But basically to set up a parallel situation to Daphne du Maurier's Rebecca, of which there are zero other references to that book in this story. So it was just shoehorned to kind of like make that situation happen, which is dumb and bad and bad writing. And I, I know I'm criticizing this book kind of harshly for that, but I honestly didn't think overall that book was that bad. I just thought that was particularly bad. Okay, let's wrap this up and bring it all home. Let's let's bring home the conclusion. Um, so the conclusion is, is that first of all, for my review, I wanna say that I actually thought The Inheritance Games was quite fun and really enjoyable to read and did everything that it needed to do, but wasn't outstanding and didn't kind of get above like the three, 3.25 range for me. And if it had done some of those things that I suggested, I think it would make it an even better book. The same thing for the Scullamans. I've really liked this series a lot, and that's partly, partially just personal taste because I really relate to the character of Galadriel. So there are certain things that I like about it that are, are just going to be taste issues that, that are going to be like why I like that I connect with that book more. For the conclusion of today, I would like to actually know your opinion in the comments down below. So I have a few questions for you. One, if you, like me, are older than the intended audience for YA, has your relationship with YA changed over the years? Do you resonate with it as much as you used to? Do you feel like you're growing out of YA? Are you seeing certain repetitions in some of the books that you like maybe tire of? You know, what you don't have to agree with me entirely, obviously. Do, does it still like 100% it's your favorite books to read? Because one thing that I will say in YA's defense is like a lot of times I feel like new genres and new sort of or resurgences of old styles of books are kind of breaking ground in YA and then like older you know, publishing that's intended for older audiences kind of following suit. So we're getting kind of this resurgence of creativity in modern like recent publishing and I'm really excited to see that. Number two, do certain plot elements like for example romance subplots for me I find particularly anno annoying and repetitive and or despite their repetition do you still enjoy them? Do you find comfort in the repetitious patterns? Um, are there certain subplots that you find really annoying that you are like okay we need to move on to something new now or certain character types that you're sort of like I'm done with the Bella Swan type let's move on to something new. Um, and number three, do you think certain YA books would be improved by developing richer characters, basically, and especially developing the inner worlds of characters, giving characters more agency, and allowing the plot to be the natural outspringing of those characters' decisions in circumstances, rather than these sort of like sometimes these shoehorned, railroaded, kind of forced narratives that seem to be... Uh, that I hate so much. <laughs> and that's, those are my three questions. I would love to know what you think in the comments down below. And until next time, my name is Alexandra and I'm still a bibliophile. <laughs>